All right. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be. Uh, my name is Christopher Harrison, and welcome to Web Wednesday, the show where we bring on somebody that's much smarter than me, which admittedly is a, a low bar, um, to uh, to talk about uh, all things web development. That one of the big challenges, of course, that we as web developers face is the the fact that there's so many different tools and so many different frameworks that are out there, and it's impossible to know all of them. It's impossible to know which ones it is that I should be spending some time with, and you know, really just to try and get an overview of everything that is uh, available to us uh, out there. Now, if you have tuned in at all to uh, Code and Coffee, which is the Thursday morning show that I do, uh, where I basically just you know write something on on the fly, and and usually things break. You know that I've been playing around with React, and that um, I'm certainly not a React expert something which I, I openly admit. And since React is something I'm trying to get into, I thought, hey, let's bring on a React expert. And so I'm very pleased to uh, be joined today by uh, Aaron Powell. Aaron is a teammate of mine. Um, he's located out in Sydney. Um, the background that uh, that he has is not the actual view from, from his window, sadly, um, but it is uh, certainly quite the view. Um, and uh, he's going to come on and, and talk a bit about uh, or quite a bit actually about React and web dev and all that good stuff. So yeah, Aaron, thanks for uh, thanks for joining tonight. Tonight it's it's still morning. Like <laughs> it's only just it was coffee time. It's ten a.m. here in Sydney. Um, but no, you are correct. This isn't what I see out of my window. Um, working from home, I'm actually in a room that was doubling as our nursery. Uh, so it's still like the nappy change table and things like that over <laughs> my shoulder. So I like to keep a background up because, well, you don't really need to see the junk that is, uh, is sitting behind <laughs> me. So that's that's why I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be much more fitting to have a lovely view of Sydney Harbour and our opera house and stuff like that. It, it also sets the scene a bit better as, uh, as someone in Sydney than, you know, a, a pile of dirty nappies. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And it's 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 the future over there. So you can, you know, tell us who, who won the um uh the, the, the Williams Osaka match. Yeah, no, there's there's no point in doing that because then you'd change who you're betting against if you're ah. placing any money down on the game. And uh, we, we've probably all seen Back to the Future and we know what happens if you know the uh, results of the sporting uh, games like too much in advance. We right. don't want to see that happening. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, the, the question that I always like to, to start with is uh, the how did you get into tech? So how did you become um, Aaron Powell? Because we all have our own, you know, different different stories, our own different paths. And I think it's just great to to share that and show that, hey, there is no one way into a tech career. So how did you become Aaron Powell? Uh, well, that was the name my parents gave me at birth. So that was probably not a lot of choice that I had in the matter. Uh, By the way, everybody, <laughs> this, know, this is going to be the humor for the entire hour. So adjust <laughs> your standards accordingly. <laughs> A parent, a parent of two small children. I'm, I'm still perfecting my uh, dad humor. See, um, <laughs> I, I don't have any kids, um, but I do tell a lot of dad jokes, which makes me a faux pas. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not going to get better from this. Is it? <laughs> no, no, this is, this is it. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, how uh, did you be? <laughs> back, back, to, back to the question. Back to the question. Liz. Um, I, I always uh, growing up, my, my dad was quite into electronics. Um, like he, he worked in uh in an industry where he got to uh, play a lot with uh like physical electronics like radios and telephones and that kind of stuff and like he used to bring those home to me and just give me a screwdriver and be like figure out how it works so i, I from a really young age i was just disassembling electronical um, devices that i had just to kind of like poke at them and see what happened and often i'd unplug them from the wall first because that's a good idea um but that kind of got my love for just tinkering and just working out how things work um when we started getting computers at home it was the same sort of thing like we i i i started with like dos as the primary os that i'd uh, uh boot into so it's like okay well how do i make things happen in here i don't have a, a mouse i've just got a keyboard so like what do i do to you know, play a game or to to work with files or like do you know do the sorts of things that you would be like doing with computers back in kind of the early 90s um 
and I guess that that really just fostered a love of of being a, a software engineer. And um, I, I I liked being able to work out how to make a computer do the things that I want it to do after the tenth attempt at doing that thing. Um, so like it's it's always been um, a passion of mine, just writing code and and seeing what it can do. Um, but I, I got into web development. I think I've been doing this for about 15, 16 years now. Um, I, I came out of university and I got offered a job at a company that was doing uh, web applications. And I had no experience building web apps at that point in time. I'd, I'd done pretty much all Unix and Linux programming, like C++ and Java on servers and uh, things like that. And so this idea of the web was completely foreign to me. Like, I mean, I, I'd used, I, I was using the internet, but I'd never stopped to think like, how does it work? Like when I click a button, what does it do? How does that happen? Um, so I, I, I got, I got very much dumped in the deep end of let's build some web applications. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had to learn things like CSS and HTML and, um, like JavaScript, uh, back when JavaScript was still this new and scary language that, well, it's now just a scary language. It's no longer <laughs> new. Um, <laughs> and like targeting, you know, like older browsers, like you know, internet Explorer, uh, like four and five and Netscape and, uh, all, uh, and that was just so fascinating for me. And, and having spent, you know, like kind of 15 years doing web apps and seeing the evolution of the way we've built, um, these sorts of things and you know, like what, what happens when you, you click a button? Originally, we'd send data to servers, and then it was we'd use JavaScript to, to make it do something so that it was a more enriching and engaging user experience. And I, all the way to, I guess, where we are today, building the sorts of applications that we get with React or Vue or Angular or like modern web frameworks. Yeah, I you know it's it's funny that you you call out like you know JavaScript is is now just a, a scary language um, and uh, you know everything that's that's changed. I, I've been doing web dev for about that that same amount of time, and if if you would have told you know like like mid nineties Christopher, hey, this is what you're going to be able to do with 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 JavaScript, I I, I would have laughed in 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 your face, you know, partly because I you know we. You weren't you know even thinking about anything like that but of course javascript just wasn't built to to do anything uh that that we're that we're using it for today and and some would argue it's still not built to do what we're using it for today but that's you know a different conversation yeah, <laughs> yeah like and having spent like years working with browsers and and stuff like that and and like understanding enough about how a browser works to really have a like a massive appreciation for people that are building browsers like i i don't i can't fathom the concept of having to like try and make a browser do the things that we want it to do uh it just the the fact that the web works as seamlessly as it does today is like it's still fairly mind-blowing to me yeah, I, I I certainly agree with with that, and and it often seems to to work at, at at times when it probably shouldn't work, or at least just logically shouldn't work the way that uh, that it actually does. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's. Let's sort of transition then into into that primary topic. I think this is uh, kind of a perfect way to to get into it, talking about um, you know trying to get JavaScript in the web to do things that it wasn't necessarily originally designed to do. Um, is is React? So React, of course, is 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 a library that we can use to to create different things. Um, but like beyond just that basic explanation, what is React? Yeah, so uh, React is uh, one of the more popular front-end frameworks at the moment, and it's it's built on a legacy of a lot of different approaches to the way we do web development. But at its core, it is a way to make a UI. It's not going to dictate things like how do you get data from a database. It's not going to tell you how to write tests. It's not going to tell you how the user should see what you're seeing. It's just responsible for turning the the, the data that you've got from somewhere into an interface that someone can interact with. Um, and it does this in a very different way to a lot of web frameworks that I've worked with over the years, because it looks at it very much from this concept of immutability. So it, immutability, if you're not familiar with it, is um, making sure that things don't change. So something that can't change is immutable. Now, 
with uh, with the way that we think of that from a like a web UI, if I was to say um, want to fetch some data from a server, well, I'm I'm changing that UI. I need to add things to it. But if we're looking at it from an idea of well, things are immutable, we can't change them. What we're doing is we're trying to build a new UI every time. Now that kind of sounds weird and like maybe it's like not a the most optimal way to do something, but by only changing the things that uh, are the small amounts that have changed each time, like we, we can understand what's new each time around, we can really reduce the amount of things that the browser has to do. Right? Browsers have to do a lot of things already to make a, an application work. Well, if we can say, instead of you know, re-render the whole page because we've got some updated data, we can tell it, actually, just this one small section of the page, change just that piece. Well, it's less work for the browser to do, and in theory, at least, things will be a lot faster for your end users. So um, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying it's a, it's a very different approach to doing web applications to what I've been familiar with uh, and doing it in a way that is really just focusing on how to turn data into a UI that someone can work with. Okay. No, that's, that, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. But let me, let me sort of then ask you um, potentially the, the obvious next question or maybe not the obvious next question. Um, which is if if my data is immutable, meaning that that my data can't change. Obviously, the whole reason that I'm creating this UX, the whole reason that I might be using something like like React, is to be able to allow the user to interact with my data, to be able to change my data. So if it can't change, how do I change it? Well, so this is where it becomes really different to again, like I say, a lot of web frameworks is that instead of changing the data, you create new data. So okay. if we think about maybe an array of numbers, uh, we've got zero to five, but we want to add the next number, which is six. Well, instead of just adding that number to that array, we create a whole new array that takes the one that we already had, zero to five, and then adds a new value to the end of it. Now we've got an entirely new set of data. It's only a small part of it has changed, but if we render that update, well, we only have a small part that's changed and we can focus on just addressing the parts of the UI that need to be updated for that small change, rather than trying to work out, well, what might have changed inside of this large data model and and try and then um, reposition everything on the screen to deal with it. Okay, that that actually makes 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 a bit of sense. Now, um, I've already got one question that's that's come in here um, about React hooks, and I'm going to get to it in 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 a couple of minutes. But that's like already Someone's like jumping ahead. yeah, it's jumping way 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 ahead here. So let's sort of like naturally pro progress to there. So you you mentioned, of course, that, that we're going to be working with data. Data is going to be um, immutable. Um, then React is going to. React is going to help me display my data out to um, out to the user and give me the ability to update my UI and and all of that. So I think this is a, a, a good way to transition into this question, which is how do I then register some data that React could then respond to? We'll get into how to update the display and all of that in a minute, but let's let's sort of keep down this path. How do I then register that inside of React and tell React, hey, can you keep an eye on this for me? Yeah, so with React, um, so React, we have uh, these concept of components. The components are the things that are going to go out to your UI. Uh, they can be uh, class-based components, and um, I've got an example of some of the stuff here off the React website. So this, uh, what we've got on screen, is a class-based component, uh, which is just running out a message that says, hello world. Now, it's appropriate. a class-based component. It's, it's nice that we, we, we did yeah. a hello world. Exactly. <laughs> well, actually, hello Taylor. I should, let, let's change that so it says hello world. Well, it's got to be. It's got to be a hello world demo. There yeah. We go. Um, so with with a React component, we have two ways that data is represented. We have state and we have props. State is data that is mutable, things that could change. So this would be where, like, we've got some results back from our server. We update our state. So we, we replace the current state with new state. And then that is uh, something we render out. Props are an immutable version of data that a component receives. So props are passed into a component. And that's actually how this demo here is working. So we've got this hello message, uh, which extends React component. And so that's a class-based component, has a render function here. And then inside of it, it says this.props.name. Now, this is how we access the props that have been provided to a component. 
And then towards the bottom, we are using that component where we're creating an instance of it called uh, hello message. And then we're giving it a prop or a property, which is the value of world. Now I can change that and maybe pop a little emoji on the end. And then that has passed some new data in. As far as the hello message is concerned, well, it hasn't changed. Like it, like it itself doesn't know that data has changed, but it's received an update given to it. Okay. Um, we could alternatively put like, if we wanted to make something that was immutable. So if we had stated components, um, we would do something a little bit different with the way this component works. Uh, actually, I just realized there's a demo of that just down <laughs> on the next line. So uh, how uh, convenient. Uh, Here's one. Here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, this uh, this timer component um, it initializes with some state. So it's this is associated with just this component. Uh, it starts with some initial state value. So if it doesn't have any seconds, and then um, using set interval. So this is uh, just built into the browser every whatever time period. So every one second, it's going to call a method called tick, which is this method here, which is then going to set the state receive the current state value and then update it so that we just increment the state by uh, the state dot seconds by one. So we're just going to keep updating that. And we can see on the little right hand side here, that's just constantly ticking over. So the component is just constantly updating uh, and there's a render function a bit further down. That's how that all renders out by this dot state dot seconds instead of this dot prop dot messages or, or name as the previous one was. Okay. So that's how we can have mutable or immutable data um, managed uh, in a class-based component. Okay. All right. So, so what you're doing then for for state in in this case, let let's sort of start there. Is you're using set state then, and you're going, hey, we originally had this value. Go ahead and replace it with this value. And right now, inside of that little stateful component, that's running every second. So every second, it's going. Here's a new value for state. Here's a new value for state. Here's a new value for state. And then it's yep. updating that in inside the the properties. It sounds kind of annoying if you're that that component with with just that constant. Here's a new value. Here's a new value. Here's, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And look, I, there's not a lot of applications where you're going to be doing it. Um, sure. You know, like an interval based time, a ticket like this, but it's, um, that's the, the, the concept is there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, now, okay. So that's, let's, let's sort of park that for, for just a minute. Cause I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we at least go through some of this a little bit, a little bit logically. So I at least wanted to touch on this. There, there is going to be a hooks conversation. I think we can get to that in, in a minute. Um, but yep. let's dig a little bit deeper then into, um, into components. So what, what is a component? Yeah, so a component in React is just the, like, it's the thing that's going to appear on, or, or be turned into what will appear on the screen for a user. So a component could be some HTML elements, which if we'll, we'll just come up to this one here. So it could be a div tag, it could be a span, it could be an input, etc., Or it could be a component that we've created ourselves, such as hello message. So this is a custom component that we've created it doesn't actually render out as HTML, but it is a construct that React understands that will eventually turn into something that a UI can deal with. Now, the reason that uh, React uses this model is that what it does is it, it creates a, a tree structure of all the components that it will be rendering out or really attempting to turn into HTML. So it uses the components that are either you've created have been provided by like a third party library that you've pulled from NPM or a DOM elements available to the browser. And then um, then tracks those in what it calls a virtual DOM. And this virtual DOM is then at some point in the future rendered out to the actual browser's DOM so that you see the elements that are appearing. Okay. All right. Now I also so I'm just going to go back to that demo screen real quick. So when when I look at that, so what I'm what I'm seeing um, what I'm seeing is quite a bit. So the first thing that I'm noticing is that you've got um, some JavaScript and you've got some HTML together. So you're creating um, um, a class using ES6. I, I know how to do that. Um, granted, I know that from TypeScript, but that's that's a different episode altogether. Um, I'm noticing <laughs> that there's a render function and that you're returning a value. So all of that up until that point, that's just like normal JavaScript. That's like JavaScript 
let, let, let's say 150 um, for to, to use kind of a, a U.S. style parlance uh, there. Um, and then what I'm noticing yeah. is you're just you've got a div tag that's just hanging out, just doing div kind of things. What how is that happening? How is it that you've just got a div tag just hanging out in a bit of JavaScript? So this is where uh, React was, uh, particularly early on, a very controversial approach to doing uh, web UIs is that it's JavaScript, but it's not JavaScript. It actually uses a syntax that um, Facebook, who created React, um, defined called JSX, which is uh, like an extended version of JavaScript, kind of JavaScript and HTML merged into one. So this isn't like the, the browser can't, handle this code as we currently see it, it has to be then converted into plain old JavaScript. And I can actually show you what that looks like if we uncheck this little tick box here. Um, it's actually kind of syntactic sugar. I mean, sort of the way that TypeScript is syntactic sugar over type safety in JavaScript. Don't bash uh, TypeScript in, in, in my presence. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm just using it as, a, as an analogy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to yeah so it this is actually what you end up running in the browser so while we might have had something that looks like it's we're rendering out some html and we're rendering out you know other things with angle brackets well it actually becomes a call to react.create element what are we creating a div tag do we have any attributes so like any dom attributes like are we providing with an id or a class name etc um, what are the children of it? So it is, it's got a literal bit of text, which is hello and a space, and then the prop.name. And then finally, when we render it out, so this is where we're telling the browser, this is where I want you to put the, the HTML that you're going to generate. We're going to say react create element. Here's the component that I want you to re render. So in this case, I'm not using a built-in component. So it's not a div tag. I'm providing you with a class-based component and then any properties or attributes that it needs to have, which is that name. And then there's nothing else to provide to that. Okay. So that's that's what we render. And that's that's how it ends up working. Uh, but we can write it like this. And most people will actually prefer to write it like this, just from a verbosity standpoint. Like this is a little <laughs> bit more verbose to try and write than it is to just put the div tags in line. Absolutely, yeah. And and so then what I'm noticing down below where you've got React on render is that that hello message component that you're creating that effectively then becomes a new HTML tag. So I can use that much in the same way that I might use a div tag or an input tag or something like that. Yeah, from a React standpoint, it, it treats it very similarly as you would um, those sorts of like a div and HTML, uh, yeah other elements and stuff like that. Okay. Um, something I, I do want to say that I personally really like about the fact that um, it is a combination of sort of like HTML and JavaScript um, all together. And this is having done work with a lot of other JavaScript frameworks prior to React is that because everything is in the, the JavaScript file, I can set a breakpoint on this line. Mm. Uh, and I can, I can actually just debug a component completely. Whereas uh, other frameworks that I've worked with where you're creating like a HTML file and then you're putting a special syntax on the HTML that tells it this is how you're going to like output to a, like do a loop or it's how you're going to bind to some data that's come from your server or whatever. It's very difficult, at least in my experience, it's very difficult to debug something when, when you want to break point but it's actually in the HTML file and not in the JavaScript, but you know it's executing JavaScript behind the scenes. This is all JavaScript. Okay. Okay. I, 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 can, certainly, I can certainly appreciate that. And I think it's also worth highlighting, um, you know, just kind of one more time that, that it is going to generate um, HTML that last yeah. week we had on um, Sarah yeah. Higley um, to chat about accessibility, and, which is, you know, a very important topic. And one of the big things that she highlighted is the importance of using um, semantic HTML so that if you're going to have a button, for example, you know what you should use is a button. Um, and so we're not creating new HTML here, that it is going to be, you know, the, 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 the HTML that we're putting into here that's going to be rendered out. So in this case, it would be a div tag. If we use um, a button element, then it's going to wind up eventually being a button. 
Yeah, so I've just popped open the um, the DOM Explorer in uh, the Edge Dev Tools here, and this is the the div tag. So if, as I hover over, it'll highlight. You can see that div's highlighted, and there's the like the text that's all rendered out. So I uh, it is it is HTML. So then um, you can do all the levels of accessibility that you should be doing to make a uh, a highly uh, accessible application. Um, so yeah, it's it 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 becomes HTML at the end of the day. Okay, fantastic. All right, that's that's good to know. Now, the last little thing that I want to note here um, is going back to, to JSX, is I noticed that the handlebars are the curly brace, which is pretty universal of, of hey, I've got something yep. that's in JavaScript, and now I want to put that into, um, into HTML. So you've got that div tag. Now we're basically going, hey, we're writing some HTML. There's a value that I need to go get from, from JavaScript, and now I'm going to put in the curly braces to make that happen. Exactly. Yeah, okay. that's that's how we uh, how we would do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now we've been getting a lot of questions about um, uh, about uh, about creating components and 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 about state. And the there was a couple of people that said um, um, ActDAC um, says that uh, class components will probably be deprecated. And then uh, Matthew asked the question: um, uh, Do you use functional components or class-based components um, when when you're writing code? So I guess the first question then is: Since this is a class-based, is there another way to do it? And then number two: Is that yep. a better way to do it than doing it with uh, with class-based? So I'll answer the second part of your question um, with uh, it depends. Okay. So is something better than something else? It's That's always going to be a very subjective answer. Um, it's going to depend on a number of factors around how you're building your application, the kinds of things that you're trying to achieve with your application and you know, stuff like that. So um, is one way of, of doing React better than another way? It's going to depend on the kind of application you're building. Uh, but to, to answer the first um, the first question, yes, there are another way that you can write components, and those are function components. So let's go back to the demo and let's replace this hello message uh, with a functional component. So I'm going to create a new one, const, and we'll call it hello message two, and then this can be a function. So this is just a standard JavaScript function that I've got here, and then I can do oops, uh, tab's not going to work. We'll do return. And then we'll do the same thing that we had up there, which is a div, div, and then we'll do hello. And this, well, we'll come back to props in a moment. <laughs> uh, we'll do div. We'll close that off. Um, and then we'll go hello too. Okay. So it's, we're, we're part of the way there, right? It's, it's rendering out at least the hello part of it. And if we bring up the dev tools again, uh, let's inspect that element. We'll see that we've still got that div there. Um, so as as we're expecting, we've ended up with the div. We've ended up with the HTML that we wanted. But how do we get the data that's being passed in? Because if you're familiar with JavaScript, uh, <laughs> you'll know that the concept of this is a fluid concept. And because I've done this as an uh, as an arrow function, uh, well, the this is inherited from its parent. So how do I get access to the props? So because I want I want props.name. Well, they become arguments that are provided to this function. So I could go props, and then I could come down and then type props.name. There's our hello world. OK. This is a function. I could deconstruct that and go name. And then instead of doing props.name, we just go name. And so this is now a function component. And I can simplify this and not use the return statement and so on and so forth. Um, you could also write this as a standard JavaScript function. So use the function keyword instead of um, using an arrow-based function. Um, I just tend to write arrow-based functions more often than I use the function keyword. It's like a few characters less. <laughs> you know, I haven't quite decided which which I prefer, if I like the function keyword or, yeah. or just always using um, fat arrow functions. Um, I will say for me personally, um, I, I do prefer function-based over class-based, partly because it's a little bit easier to read. But I think the bigger thing is it it solves this. Um, because, you know, like, like, like you mentioned, that yeah. that the concept of, of, of this in JavaScript is, is fluid. And this will change based on how you've declared the function, based on where the function is based on how the function is 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 called based on on the time of day I'm pretty sure that there's a random number generator somewhere that that, that <laughs> changes things it 
Yeah, and so I, I like being able to just go, hey, here's my parameter, and then that just makes it really clear, oh, okay, these are the props, um, and, uh, and, and go from there. Yeah. So yes, exactly. That's that's I, I that's kind of why I prefer it as well because yeah, you you can get yourself into a world of pain, uh, relying on this and this not changing for you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I also appreciate um, in uh, in TypeScript the fact that I can then put in a type hint um, and indicate my data type for for props, which then just enables all yep. sorts of uh, uh, different types of IntelliSense and type checking and and uh, and and so forth. So. Um, at yep. some point, I need to do a Web Wednesday on, on TypeScript. That's a, a different uh, a different conversation. <laughs> so um, maybe, maybe if we've got time uh, before the end, I'll, I'll I'll show you what TypeScript and uh, and React can do together. Yeah, yeah that 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 would be that would be fantastic. Okay, so so now we've got the 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 function based component. You you did really the exact same thing that you had with with the class base. You just did it inside of a, a function um, instead. Now, inside of the class space, when we were talking earlier about state, you were using this dot state. Yeah. So this doesn't exist. Uh, there is no spoon. So um, <laughs> how do we um, how do we then work with state if we're working with a function based uh, component? Well, that's that's where the people that have been hanging out to talk about hooks are going to be excited because that's where React hooks come in. Uh, so a function component is well, originally were, um, people referred to them as stateless components because well they couldn't have state associated with them, uh, and that's because as you pointed out, you don't have a this context, so there was no way to to do that sort of tracking. Uh, so for for a long time, you kind of relied on on class based components as a way to manage state, and then function components maybe as a way to just render out just the um, the data that was changed in there. But well, not all components um, are, are going to to want to have, or not all applications are going to want to have class based components. So uh, the React team introduced this concept of hooks. Uh, hooks are a way to introduce state into a function component. Now, hooks only work with function components. They don't work with class-based components. And they allow you to do all the things that we want to do with a, um, a, a application that uses a uh, state, but purely from a function one, uh, a functional component. So let's let's pick a different example that we've got here. Maybe let's use this one, this markdown renderer that we've got. And let's turn, whoop, if I don't scroll up too far, <laughs> where, there we are, there we go. Um, so this is a class-based component. But let's look at how we could turn this into maybe a function component. So we're going to create a new, uh, we'll come down and create a new one. Ah, oh, it's really going to be tedious that it's bouncing around like that. Uh, but we'll do const markdown editor two because naming things is super hard. <laughs> I'm very creative and... when I name things for, for on the fly demos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we let's, let's just grab all of this uh, this return statement. Pop that in here. It's going to really bother me that uh, things aren't indenting properly, but I will get over it. Okay, so ta-da! We've made things not work. That's probably not ideal, uh, but let's well, let's make them properly work. That, that, so that, that's my superpower how... is making things not work. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so how are we going to deal with things like well, a text editor? Uh, sorry, sorry, text area. It's, the, it's an editor, but yeah, it's, it's the text area. Um, and we're also going to need to have some way that we can render out this uh, raw markup. Let's start with, well, what's the value going to be for this text area? So it, it provides a default value, and it's getting this dot state. Well, we know that that doesn't work. So we can use hooks. And this is where I'm going to find out whether or not the, um, the, the editor experience that we've got here is going to support hooks or... Uh, We'll, we'll quickly segue to some other way to get hooks. Uh, maybe I'll pop over to the console here and see if I get any error messages. I'm getting lots. Good start. <laughs> I, I think it might just um, be because okay. you don't have this at the moment. Yeah, I think that's probably where a lot of it's going to be. Um, OK, so we are going to do const, uh, what have we got, the uh, text, and then we'll go set text. I'll explain what all of this is doing in a moment. If, whoop, where did my cursor go? Text is going to be equal to react.use state. And there we go. 
Okay, and then we're going to need to have like a handle change function. Uh, but let's just comment some of this stuff out. Comment. There we go. And just going to slide we'll the need screen to... over our scotch here to make it a little. There we go. Okay. Um, now, now we've got rid of all of our red errors and successfully we have created an input field. I can type some stuff in there, but well, is it going to do anything with that value? Well, we'd kind of like it to ultimately render that as markup. So I'd like to be able to go hello and world because hello world is the only thing that we know how to do. Um, but I need to, I need to tell React that as this value is changing, that it needs to be aware of it. Now in our class-based component, we had this on-changed handler. So, well, because Re React is immutable. So it, we need to, we need to do something to tell React that the value of that input has changed and the value of our text here is changed. Um, so first off, let's say, uh, let's set the start value to be text. And now we'll type in, awesome. So it, I can still type in, it doesn't know that that value has changed. So our on change, we're going to then add a custom handler, which will take the event. Uh, and I'm going to do this in line rather than creating um, separate functions, mostly from laziness standpoint. And if we went, say, console.log e.target.value. Oh, at least I think it's value. Yeah, it's e.target.value. And we'll bring up our dev tools again, clear out the console, scroll back down. We can see very faintly as I type in, we go, hello, world. Okay. So that function is being executed every time I'm doing a key press. So like the, the value of that text editor is changing. So that on change, that's not something that's special to React. That's just a, um, that's just part of text area. That's just the normal text area event. Yes. Every time you change it, that's now being raised. And so right now you're just printing, printing that out. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if I if I was to come over, um, I'm going to have some React Dev tools. There we go. Ha, I was amazed that worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just I, I couldn't see any icons there. Uh, let's see if I can find this component. Here we go. So Markdown Editor two. Now it's aware that it's got some state, and that state is currently not set to anything. Instead of doing console.log, we're going to do set text. And that set text comes from up above. Yes. Okay. So I'll we'll come back to what that's doing in a moment. Okay. And right. we go, hello, world. And if we find this component again, now we'll see that state has been updated to hello, world. Excellent. That's what we, what we want, because we're going to need to then render that out later. So how did all of that work? Well, with React hooks, we have a number of different hooks. And the one I'm using here is use state. So React hooks all start with this um, with use as a keyword because that's the the convention that they've got. So it's use state, use effect, and so on and so forth. So use state um, allows us to create some state for a function component. We give it a default value, which is, I'm just defaulting it to an empty string, and then the return of that is an array that has two arguments. The first argument is going to be the current state. The second argument is a state mutation function. So you can name those whatever you want to name them. In this case, I'm calling it text and set text, but there's no reason that I couldn't call this um, Jane and then set Jane. Like it, it doesn't matter what they're called. They, you call them what is relevant for uh, your application. So we'll call them text and set text because that's representing this bit of state. Now I could also have as many bits of state as I want. I could have const, uh, const foo and set foo. And then this is react use state, and this could be a number. And then I could update that as a number. It could be an, it could be an object that has text and that has an empty string there. So initially, instead of doing text, we could do foo.txt. So, and, and like I said, you can have as many of these as you want. Now, the last thing we're gonna need to do is, well, how do we render this markdown out at the moment? Well, I need to do something that will render it out. So we use, um, because I need to generate some HTML that's going to render out, we use this dangerously set in a HTML uh, just because React is trying to be really careful about not just 
arbitrarily injecting HTML because that's a, an avenue for cross-site scripting or XSS syntax. So we have to be really explicit. Like, I know I'm, I'm aware that I'm just arbitrarily adding HTML that you have no concept of or control over. And I'm, I'm trusting that the HTML I'm injecting is going to be fine. So I need to, well, how do I generate this markdown? I could write another function that we pass stuff through, or I could add some more state that's actually going to have that. So let's do some more state const, and then we'll call it markdown and set markdown. And this will be react use state. And that's going to also start off as an empty string because we don't have any markdown initially. And then here we will do double underscore HTML, and that will be markdown. That's how we render out, uh, at least that's how I think we render it out. Let me just double check up here. Yes. And have I got all of my squigglies correct? Excellent. And I am getting a warning about something on some line somewhere. There it is. Who on the stream for, saw the bug before uh. I did? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody yet, but I'm I'm like furiously trying to go through all the comments here. There's a lot of, of questions and comments, which is uh, which is fantastic. Um, okay, so awesome. so now you've got that now you've got that working. So now you can put in the input in in Markdown, and now that will that will properly display out. Well, so I can I can type in something here. Hello uh -oh. world. Okay, but I need to do something that's going to convert that into Markdown. Right. Uh, the way. They use this, uh, so in the, in the class-based example, we had this generate raw mark, uh, markdown or raw markup, which was then using a library called Remarkable, which that was setting to stay like a bunch of, I, I can't do any of that sort of thing. So let's instead pretend that we've been provided markdown, the, the markdown uh, renderer as a argument that's been passed in. So then we can go MD equals new uh Remarkable. I think it was called Remarkable. So that's going to be passed in correctly. And we're going to introduce another hook. I'm going to use the React uh, Use Effect hook. So Use Effect is when I want to do something that is the side effect of a hook that's changed, uh, a state value that's changed. So what I need to do with the effect is I need to tell it what are the bits of state that could change that you need to be aware of. So it's going to be text, and it's also the markdown. It's also props that I might be dependent on. So these are things that could result in this effect running. So whenever text changes, run this effect. And we're going to then do inside of this, we'll do set markdown to the result of MD dot. Uh, let's actually have a look at how we do it. Uh, was it uh, MD dot render render text? So now I can hopefully go, hello, world. And we've got our markdown working. And that's all happening with hooks. Okay. We haven't, uh, this is a purely stateless component done with hooks. And, and hopefully that's uh, like the, the people that were, were wanting to see hooks in action. We've got there and we've, we've shown and, and hopefully that's, that's um, tackled the sorts of things you were hoping to at least initially learn around hooks. Yeah, so there was a there was a couple of questions um, uh, around um, around all of this. So one of them is um, about trying to make um, uh, about trying to make hooks more readable, um, so that um, uh, that nose uh, nose ratio. Um, um, says when I review somebody else's code using React hooks, I often feel like it's uh, only easy, easily readable to the person who wrote it, as opposed to say um, Vue.js or, or other framework code that uh, that they've seen. Um, must be just me. Can you give any tips on how to improve readability of hooks-based code? So one of the biggest tips that I'd have around making re like more readable code is trying to break down hooks. Um, the, the state in particular with hooks to smaller um, pieces. And because uh, I could create one like monster state, um, like where all the data, and then we do whoop, data. Oh, if I data and then set all the data, which then is react, uh, react.use state. And then we have like text, which is empty, markdown, which is empty. And then we have a thing that's going to then modify like parts of that state and not other parts. And it, 
It just kind of, it can get all a little bit messy because we've just got this massive one, like, monster object that is looking after all of our data. So breaking them down into like this, it, it, there's nothing wrong with having multiple bits of stack. The next thing that you can do is, and something that I like, I'd maybe consider doing in a refactor of this is creating a custom hook. So a custom hook, I could do const, uh, we'll call this uh, use markdown. And then this is going to be a hook that, uh, so internally, it's actually going to wrap up a bunch of this logic. So we'll grab this here and then that so inside of this hook it's actually going to have the text and the uh the markdown itself and then we're going to return text markdown and set text so instead of in my hook i uh, so inside of my hook i can do const uh text mark markdown and set text and then we can do use markdown uh now did i type all of that correctly i did but i have an error somewhere which is awesome uh set text text markdown uh oh i didn't pass it uh, and then we've got to pass in md pass in that's what I was missing. Okay, so what I've done is um, I've, I've kind of enca encapsulated all of the core functionality elsewhere. So it's very clear when I come to my Markdown editor that I'm using something that is th this, somewhere else I've got something that is handling the Markdown generation. Okay. Um, instead of maybe passing an array, you could pass it, a, like you could return an object that has properties and then I could deconstruct this as an object. So then as a consumer, I'm, it's a lot more clearer what the like what the output might be. Uh, and this still works all the same. Hello. So this is all the same. So so those are some of the tips that I'd have around re, um, improving readability is break them down into smaller, more concise things that you're doing and extract, extract out things into custom hooks that don't necessarily need to uh, they, they encapsulate some of the logic together because well my markdown editor component never had a need to use the set markdown function so i never provide it to it okay all right all, all of that definitely makes makes sense and i think that just like at a high level that's typically just good advice in in general is if something is too complicated to read try bringing it down into into smaller functions so that way it or, or smaller chunks so that way each part is focused in on okay i'm just doing this and this is all that i'm doing and so now in a lot of ways your co your component is is sort of back to like the function components of 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 your that you were talking about that are are completely um stateless that uh, that they weren't able to to yeah. work with state at all and so now you've you've got just um, uh, that you've got just this. So all that it's doing, all that it's responsible for, is just I'm I'm going to be a dumb little thing. I'm just going to display some data, and then it's going to be that uh, use markdown um, custom hook that you've created. That's then going to be responsible for managing the state and updating things and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That um, uh, that 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 makes sense. I am going to get to the to the controversial portion of um, uh, of of the show here um, because somebody um, uh, somebody did ask it. Uh, well, um, asked it in 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 a, in a roundabout way. So uh, Jalitter um, um, says um, Angular components are more readable, in in my opinion. So I'm going to change that into a question, which is. Compared to Angular, compared to Vue, if you have any level of, of experience with, with other frameworks, why do you find that you gravitate towards React? So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make you take a stance on which is better. I'm going to say, in your personal opinion, why do you find yourself using React versus fill in other <laughs> framework here? Well, I was going to say, um, I spent a lot of years doing consulting work. So anytime anyone asks me for why is something better than uh, something else, the answer is always it depends <laughs> because there's no right answer. Um, like, er everything, is, everything is going to work right for someone. And that's the reason that we have lots of different approaches to the same sort of problem. That's why uh, like Angular tackles it from a different angle to Vue, to React, 
to uh, and then like the their companion libraries mobx versus redux versus um ngx and, you know they're like they all tackle things in slightly different ways so why do i gravitate towards react compared to the other ones uh, there's a couple of reasons one of them i mentioned earlier is the debuggability of it the fact that um like again i'm just going to pop over the dev tools um and we'll see if i can find actually yeah i that's maybe how we can find it. Uh, actually, it's probably running in a minified version, so it might not be easy to find. Um, but because this is all JavaScript, um, and uh, we turn off the JSX version, I could I can put a breakpoint just like smack bang in the middle of a custom hook, and I can debug that. And the, the logic that is then resulting in it rendering out as HTML, I can put a breakpoint on that and see it happening and see how it's going through a loop of data or if there's a conditional check that's happening. I can I can breakpoint on those conditional checks. Whereas my experience with other frameworks where you're where you're annotating the HTML, it can be a lot more difficult to do that debugging because you're you don't have the ability to to put the breakpoint in the HTML file where the conditional block is being defined or where your loop is being defined and something like that. So someone who came from a consulting background, yeah, it, it, it made it a lot easier to, to, to work with people that were coming to web development for the first time or refreshing their skills with web development with bottom frameworks, being able to sit down and go, this is how you can debug and step through your code versus um, this is how you write some more code to debug your code. Uh, that's one of the things that I like about it. Okay. The other is the, yeah. No, keep uh, talking. The immutability side. Yeah. All right, no. So then, <laughs> I'll yeah. just keep. I'll keep writing. <laughs> no, actually, because you you had a real quick point there, um, or you're, you're about to is was was about immutability. Why do you like immutability? Yeah. Um. And again, this probably comes from experience that I've had building um, applications over the last fifteen years. Uh, the number of bugs that I've dealt with in applications that have been caused by data changing somewhere else in my application that I wasn't aware it was changing. So if we think about the way um, other web frameworks tend to, to have like maybe a publish subscribe model or an event system that does like broadcast notifications of, uh, of data binding um, and it, it does implicit data binding. So you, you don't have to think about how a text box is wired up so that when you're typing in it, it's going to be updating or when you button click you, it just, it, it wires up that button click for you. Um, I, I spent a lot of time trying to, again, debugging where where did where did this data change come from? I have no idea where this data change came from. With React, you have to be very explicit with that. Um, I'm just going to jump up to the the last of the demos that's on this page that I haven't looked at, which is um, this to do list. So I can I can type into a text box, excellent. But I'm going to comment out this on change line. And now, if I'm going to type into that text box, um, you can trust me because you can hear my keyboard. It's not doing anything, and that's because this is immutable. The, the state value that we're bound to, the value of this.state.text is immutable. So unless we explicitly tell React the data is changing, which is what this on change handle is being used for, React is just like, I don't care that you've typed, you haven't told me that the data has changed. So by like, whether it's data coming back from like a fetch request to your server or user input or anything like that unless you're very explicit that this is data that's changing data doesn't change and your application in turn it doesn't change so you from a from a uh, understanding how an application works and the where data is with inside of your application it's very clear of this is what's caused change and then when your ui changes so if we just do um uh give talk and then if i click that button it's very clear that this is how that uh that data change and this is where data has come from and this is why that has happened so again it, probably the immutability answer comes back to it's a lot easier to debug from the experience that i've had um teaching people to do web development 
No, I, I, I certainly appreciate that. I remember listening to a podcast um, um, quite a while ago when React was still relatively new. They were talking about, you know, that that, that concept of, of one-way data binding. Um, and, and the hosts were like, this is, you know, doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense because, you know, for the most part, everything up until then was was that 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 two way. And the, the guest said, as it turns out, it's rather freeing um, and then started to explain everything yeah. that, that that you just explained there. So that uh, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and look, you can do all of this sort of um, immutable data pr approach, um, like one-way data binding and stuff like that with pretty much every web framework that's out there. So it's not like this is something that's unique to React. Um, it's just a React, I think it did a lot of work to popularize it. And as a result, um, I, I got very invested in the way that it worked and and um, the experience that that gave me. And I was also very, I, I'm not turned off by the fact that there is angle brackets inside of my JavaScript. That was a, <laughs> a large barrier for a lot of people. It's like, why is there angle brackets in my JavaScript? And as someone who did a lot of .NET development uh, and .NET web development, I was used to writing like ASPX files and, and Razor files where you were combining the data coming back from your server with HTML. The same is with PHP and stuff like that. Like you are still writing, like you're writing PHP in HTML. Why is it so much more different to write JavaScript in your HTML? Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree completely that I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm not a purist when it comes to trying to separate out my, my display from, from my code, because it's, it, it, like, like you highlighted, it's, it's effectively impossible that, that you always need to bring the chocolate and the peanut butter together, um, to be able to effectively do whatever it is that you're trying to do. Yeah. So cool. All right. Um, I, I, we've got like three minutes left here. Um, uh, actually, this is like a perfect question to, I think, close on. Um, Rashmi asked the question, um, are there any plugins or extensions to help debug uh, React? So the number one extension that I would make sure that people have when they're doing React applications, and I will just pop over the dev tools here and see if they're going to zoom out. So the one that I showed just before, uh, which you can't see in my <laughs> toolbar for some reason, uh, is, uh, is there's a React extension, uh, the React, oh, where is it? I'm just going to randomly click into like my lack of icons and it's going to appear at some point. There it is. Here I appreciated are. the fact that the first time that you tried to bring it up, you clicked on the invisible icon, boom, and there it was. It was like, yeah, yeah that, that, that was a once in a lifetime shot there. He's never going to be able to do that again. <laughs> I, I know. It's so, so frustrating. Um, so this is the React extension for, um, it works in, in Edge, in Chrome. Uh, there's the equivalent ex extension for Firefox. Um, I'm unsure of Safari because I haven't had a Mac device for years, so I, I don't know what their debugability is like. Um, and this just gives us a view of the virtual DOM. So this is what React sees for your component structure. Now, this is running minified, so it's a little bit, um, I, the, the names of components are going to be a little bit silly. Uh, but the ones that we created in our little demo, so we can see hello message and hello message two and stuff like that. Um, and I can click onto those and I can then inspect things like here's the props that were passed in. Here are the hooks that it has. So you can see this one at the bottom has a hook called markdown. And then it has some internal state, which is the state value. Um, that's the text value. And then there's state, which is the markdown that's rendered. And there's an effect hook. Um, so this can give you an insight into like, how does React see the components that you've got? In terms of debugging, like, um, like it's it's not rendering out what I'm expecting it to render out, uh, because it, it is rendering it is running JavaScript at the end of the day, um, and uh, I'll keep flicking off the JSX uh, thing here. Is that the JavaScript debugger in your browser, or if you're using VS Code, um, uh, like the the Edge or the Chrome or the Firefox remote extension, so you can debug from VS Code. You can just stick a breakpoint in this JavaScript file. Um, tools, whether you're using Babel for the compilation or you're using TypeScript, because you can use TypeScript with React to, to render out and do type safe React. Um, they'll give you source maps. So you can you actually debug the JSX that you originally wrote through source maps, but it's um it's it's just running the normal JavaScript. So the debugability is is really quite fantastic from my experience. Okay. Um, like I said, it's it's going to be somewhere inside of these files that have been randomly, like dynamically generated for me, but I probably don't have, uh, I, I won't be able to just like click around and find <laughs> them or anything like that. 
<laughs> no, yeah. I love it. It'll that's, be in there somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's fantastic. We're gonna have to figure out how to get you back on in in a couple months to to go like one step further to like talk about a little bit about Babel and about uh, about TypeScript, um, but also like about project setup and things like that, which we just didn't have time to because literally an hour flew by yeah. like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I do need to to, to close. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for for coming on. Um, you can find Aaron on Twitter at Slace. I, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So you can find um, Aaron there. You can find us here every Wednesday talking about some web dev topic. Thanks for tuning in. That was uh, Web Wednesday on React. Um, and yeah, have a great night, morning, or or otherwise. Bye. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>